Lovely. Well, I think we can make a bit of a start. So I'm, I'm sure a few more will join as we um, as we commence. So I say thank you again for joining us. Um, third webinar that we've done very kindly with Nella um, and also joined by Wyatt Steedman. Um, as I say looking particularly focusing on obviously the future of the office on the South Coast and today trying to focus a bit more on the well-being uh, of offices and also looking at staff and um, some sustainability so really interesting stuff that I think we'll cover today. So without further ado uh, I'm about to hand over to Nella and uh, yeah floor's yours. Good morning everybody. Um, so thank you to everyone that has joined us for all three. I hope you found it insightful but today we are going to be covering building health and well-being into the workplace. And it's very much tenants driving investors demanding for healthy buildings. So what we've discovered in our previous webinars is that the war for talent is intensifying. Employees are faced with situations where location and cost is no longer the most important thing, particularly if they can't attract the right skill set. So they're using their real estate to add to their competitive advantage. Next slide, please. But what is a healthy building? It's no longer just about putting a shower in and a couple of bike racks drilled down in the car park. We have moved leaps and bounds, not only in terms of sustainability, but in wellness as well. So wellness in the workplace is one of the top topics that I'm speaking to several clients about right now. It's more fundamental to a client's objectives than ever before, particularly on a corporate level, who have corporate social responsibility targets. So according to the report from the Wellbuilding Institute, sorry, go back a slide. Um, the, they surveyed global real estate investment managers and stakeholders. 90% of the investors expected demand from healthy buildings to grow in the next three years. And 87% expected to increase demand for healthy buildings over the past 12 to 24 months. And that was even before the pandemic. So health, healthy buildings have been always been a priority. And 89% plan to enhance their company's health and wellness strategies in the coming years. Next slide. However, they're doing this for different reasons. 100% cited that it was COVID related, and that was a main driver. While 86% it was about human health, 71% um, about tenant satisfaction, and 71% for market differentiation, 57% for enhancing reputation, and 43% for compliance concerns. They were all other key motivators that were driving the health and buildings. And it's not surprising that COVID has elevated the importance of health and investment in decision makings. There's definitely a healthy building movement and the physical and social environment is the number one determinant in our health. It's more important to our health compared to the access in medical care, for example, or our DNA. Next slide. But did you know that we spend an average of 90% indoors, 5% outdoors, which is really depressing. And the rest is in transit, cars, trains. So we're spending a huge amount of time indoors. I don't know about you, but I was pretty shocked by those stats. So designing a healthy building is about how do we make those spaces um, thrive for people. Next slide. Building wellness reflects the impact that the physical workplace has on a person's physical mental health. For example, lighting, air quality, noise, and the materials that are being used. Although green buildings have become a much more a must have for owners and occupiers in the bigger cities, with greener buildings addressing environmental sustainability, building wellness and health and wellness focus much more specifically on human impact. Next slide. 
So a number of people who have experienced the effects of a sick building syndrome, where people have complained about headaches, itchy eyes, runny nose, um, and this can be due to poor lighting, poor ventilation, or materials used, for example. The last year, it is definitely evident that people care about their health even more so. Next slide. And this is one of the reasons why we believe that landlords and investors on the South Coast have got to pay attention as it's no longer about a building that doesn't cause you harm because if the, if the physical and social environment is your number one determinant of your health, why would you not want to improve the health and well-being of the people that will be spending most of their waking hours? So we're in a much more human-centric environment and we need to design space with the end user in mind. So data is king. Having monitoring sensors installed where we can share with the cleaners, for example, can improve the cleanliness, controlling the lighting and use capacity. Some might think that this is excessive. However, I pre presented a few years ago on a similar topic and asked the audience how many owned a Fitbit or some form of fitness device. A majority in the room raised their hands. And interestingly, I don't have one, but I do check the health app on my iPhone, which monitors my steps, screen time. And even with my home, we can check the temperature of each room, control the heating in each sections of the house. We have the Alexa app that turns on the lights or the music, um, and we can view our security system from our phones. Yes, it's a little bit like Big Brother, but technology has advanced so quickly that we need to integrate it into our working environments. Next slide. When we think about healthy buildings, it isn't one that just focuses on the air quality or materials selection or mental health. A healthy workplace needs to touch on all aspects. So your physical health and well-being, your social health and well-being, and your mental health and well-being. Next slide. The way we think about sustainability has changed. It's not just about reducing carbon emission or water efficiencies. It's all about all of those things and much more. And the reason why it's come to the forefront is because businesses are looking at the environmental social governance framework. Environmental sustainability has been easy to quantify because you can monitor how much energy do you use in your building or what is your carbon footprint. Whereas social sustainability has been harder to quantify. And that looks at health and well-being, gender diversity and accessibility. But I believe this is one of the reasons why it's becoming more topical for businesses to be setting and quantifying social sustainability aspects. And increasing investors are seeking well-building standards or similar certifications so they can provide a quantifiable framework around this idea of social sustainability. Next slide. The adoption of the health and well building certification, such as fit well and well building standards, has not been heavily adopted in the regions, and only a handful have been carried out. But frameworks enhance transparency through providing clear wellness standards. So, for corporate occupiers that are relocating out of major cities, they're reviewing their real estate strategies and they've been used to this high level certification. So we anticipate that landlords and developers on the South Coast will have to up their game in order to attract these corporates. Given the severity of the pandemic, well buildings are no longer just a nice to have, but a key decision driver for many. Next slide. So COVID-19 has accelerated the need to build wellness into real estate, and it will become even more important in terms of access to metrics that track not only light and noise, but also building ventilations, air filtration and extended cleaning. PropTech and MedTech will be the next generation of smart buildings that will allow operators to make real time data decision decisions. Next slide. Healthy building is not new. However, what is new is a transformation of the notion of work and how we work. 
The pandemic has accelerated digital transformation of businesses and have brought individual health and well-being to the forefront as a critical priority. Employees are expecting um, a safe, productive and a seamless experience wherever they work. And we're, of course, coming out of a pandemic. So there hasn't been a time before where there is so much focus on a healthy building. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much. Yeah, obviously, it was uh, great to get your insights on that. Um, so, yeah, pass over to Wyatt to uh, take Paul on this next topic. Thanks, Josh. And thank you, Nella, for a very interesting overview on that. That was good. Um, so what I'd like to talk about is how we can use the workplace as a positive influence on the well-being of those working within it. Um, so typically with the work we do, we work on um, Cat B works for end users. And I'd like to really view it from that approach today. Um, and what I'm wanting to focus on is more on the mental health and well-being and social health and well-being than physical. Um, so obviously moving on to the next slide, please, Josh. Um, space is an experience, um, whether it's for good or whether it's bad, um, it is an experience. And obviously with uh, staff working within an environment, you want to be, them to be productive. So they're servicing your business well. It makes sense to maximize that, that through the workplace and how it's designed. So obviously we experience through the five senses, which are there, I don't need to run through them all. It's very easy to um, design with the visual aspect in mind, making sure it looks good. That's a very easy point, but it's where we start nailing down these other points and make sure they're properly done in the workplace. So it's performing well, that that's a really high performing workplace. Um, so just like to keep that in mind as we go through these next couple of slides. Um, so there's two concepts I wanted to share today, the first being um, biophilic design and the second, a new trend that we're seeing come in, which is called resumercial. But um, first looking at the biophilic design, um, it's a lot more than just plants. So many people have heard of biophilia and associated with planting, which is right, but it's a whole lot more than that. So really, it's our connection with nature. It's the, the innate um, urge from humans to connect with nature around them and it really goes back to ancient man there's a there's a theory called the savannah theory which really um, taps into how our inner mind is working through our instincts of ancient man living in in the savannah and in the open plains um, and so we tend to associate things like caves or smaller spaces as, as safe for safety and refuge and obviously the open areas are much more active. So that's where we'd see hunting and um, gathering food and that sort of activity happening. And that's innate with us. And obviously we're very much governed by light. So obviously the sun rises each morning and it, it sets in the evening. And that's how we govern our day is by the, a natural um, form. And so just, going on from that and how we can integrate that into the into the workplace if we go to that next slide we can have a look at how that can translate through so obviously we see a lot of open plan which would be very much like the, the open planes you can see there but unfortunately we tend to make it very monotonous through that open plan just having desking that all looks the same whereas realistically in nature nothing's the same and linear it's very varied across that and that's how we need to look at our open plans and we have different environments so different types of work areas and obviously the cave um i love this little booth here that we fitted up in london it's a it's a, a great piece and it's, it's like the modern day cave and there's many more concepts like that smaller rooms around the outside of the open plan where we can go if we just need a bit of time out a little space for ourselves and then obviously lighting is really important. So we spoke about that, the sun rising and setting um, and color is a really important part of that. So obviously in the morning, it tends to be a much bluer light from the sun and towards the end of the afternoon, it's more red and yellow hues, which is much warmer. But unfortunately we're working a lot of offices which only have one type of light and that's the same all through the day. So that's actually messing our body clock up a bit. And we're, that's where a lot of the, the burnout comes from. So it's really important to start adding those elements in. So bringing some warmer hues in the afternoon and often um, turning lamps on as well is a good idea because I've seen the sun sets, it comes down. So making sure we have lights or wall lights or lower lights towards the end of the afternoon. So we're just keeping in sync with 
what our body clock should be. Um, and obviously planting. I won't leave it out. Um, it's the obvious thing, but it's very important. Um, and really the important thing with it is that we associate that with food. Um, obviously, if, if there's planting, the ground's good and there's, there's likely to be food around. So working in a clinical white or gray environment, there's something deep down in our brain that's not liking that. So plants are really, really good in the workplace. And obviously natural planting, real planting is great, but even having artificial plants, which are lower maintenance, that does a whole lot for the human mind and helps productivity. Um, so moving on to my next um, little point I'd like to make on the concept of resimersion, which is very new. We're seeing this come up a lot more now. It's bringing together residential um, look and feel and commercial. So uh, quite a new trend. And it's really about people being working in, in their home. They've been brought the office home for the last 12 months. And it's about bringing the home into the office and having that feel. And really, people have found there's elements at home that support their work much better. And they don't have access to that in the office. So it's about making the office a great place to, to be and having the best of both worlds. So firstly, looking at layout um, and how we design and space plan a, an office. If you think about a typical living space, you tend to have a sitting room, which is more soft seating, um, quite relaxed. And then you have a dining area, which is where people come together for eating or you know doing homework at the end of a school day. But there's people together doing different things in the same place. And it's about bringing people together, creating that culture and um, really holding the, the team together. And then kitchens, this is a really, really important one. So people have found that they can cook themselves a good square meal at home. And when they get back to the office, the resources are much more limited. And so when we're thinking about designing a new space and integrating a tea point or kitchen area, we need to think about what would I want at home and am I integrating that in the office? So we've got that facility available. And then obviously um, the other element is bedroom or private space. So having that a space to go, if you just need to break out, have some time to yourself to focus on stuff, or if you just need a bit of meditation time, have, have those areas available for people, because otherwise staff are gonna not want to be exposed in that environment. And I think this is gonna be really, really key going forward with people less used to working in busy environments. I think there's going to be a higher demand for more quiet and private spaces within the workplace. So onto my last slide then, um, again on Resimercial, but more looking at the look and feel and how it's going to affect that side of the office. And um, we're going to see much softer tones and um, fabrics coming in, much more muted color palette. So we've seen a lot of quite bright, sharp colors in the workplace, but we're seeing currently people are asking for much um, more pastel tones and muted tones in, in the workplace. They're just more calming, they're much more homely, and it's, that's where people want to be working, is in that sort of environment. And another big element is um, space dressing. So I like to describe this as the, the elements that make a house a home. So it's like the candles and the um, incense. It's all the little elements tapping into those five senses we discussed earlier um, and bringing those into the workplace. Um, obviously, we'll probably have to be a little bit careful about candles. It just popped out there, something we'd have at home, but <laughs> probably a fire risk on that front. So we want to be a bit careful. Don't take that as a given. But there's lots of different ways we can integrate um, good smells um, and good fabrics and stuff. So there's a better textures that comes down to the feel. Um, and obviously a lot more curtains are being asked for in workplaces now. So rather than just having the um, sort of clinical blind sort of look, um, it's much softer and more homely. So that's what we're seeing currently in, in, um, from clients in terms of their requirements. So hopefully that's a little insight on the design front. Over to you, Josh. Lovely. Yeah, thank you very much, Wyatt. Um, I'll say a great overview there on looking at some of the different well-being aspects. Um, so I'm just going to try and summarise or kind of move on, I guess, another element of well-being, um, massive topic in its own right, is sustainability and try and cover a few points on this. So um, 
I thought I'd start with trying to look at some of the accreditations uh, and standards that we typically see quite a bit of. Um, so Nella already has referred to the well-being uh, standard for um, for buildings, well-building standards. So which obviously is a, is a massive one, often gets brought in particularly in um, kind of more construction, uh, new construction, although I have, I believe we are starting to see uh, a standard around refurbishment, which will be interesting to see how that um, plays out and we're starting to become more aware of that. But the fit well standard uh, is definitely something that we've seen and, and it's probably arguably slightly more achievable um, for a lot of maybe more traditional buildings. So it touches on not just the actual building itself, but some of the other elements um, in terms of the policies and also looking at how it interacts with the local area. Um, so I'd say there's a couple of points there on how that's how that's worked out. Um, and this is really just a, a summary, I guess, uh, of the main areas, um, the 12 areas that they touch on within the standard. So obviously kind of different weightings in terms of different levels of impact uh, overall on the score. Um, so I was just going to touch briefly on the, the top three, the sort of high impact elements, as I say, because this is a, a massive topic in its own right. Um, so locations, particularly looking around how it uh, is geographical location in relation to local amenities, um, you know, kind of how it supports local shops, uh, you know, essentially the local industry, and also how it ties in with public transport links. Um, which obviously is a, a massive point from a green travel, um, trying to look at improving that. So that's just kind of particularly focusing on the actual geographical element of, of the building. Um, the second point around indoor environments, so this is more looking at the actual building itself. Um, so there's a big part around the signage, um, the policies that are introduced, and kind of, I guess, one of the big topics is looking at um, air quality, which we've obviously touched on. Um, into air quality and probably feeds in very well to some of like the building systems um, in terms of management systems that we're starting to see. Um, so actually looking at how the different elements are monitored um, and how that data is used and kind of fed back uh, into the, the different elements. So the, the final point is around shared spaces, um, which I find very interesting actually. So this is looking at if you particularly if you've got a multi-tenant site um, whether you can create and bring kind of more communal um, shared spaces. So, for example, uh, breakout areas, um, maybe kind of shared kitchen sort of tea point facilities, um, or maybe looking at more sort of the fitness um, side. You know, there's a big thing around sort of yoga and different fitness classes. You know, whether they're sort of starting to bring those spaces and actually um, engaging other tenants and potentially even you know, opening that up to the potentially the local community and, you know, kind of just... I guess sharing those elements within the within the building. Um, as I, say, I appreciate that's a very brief overview on quite a big topic there, um, but just I guess give a bit of an insight on something we're seeing. Um, the other one I'd like to refer to is the cradle to cradle certification. So this is focusing particularly around um, sustainability and looking at kind of the idea of a circular economy. Um, so often applied to furniture. Uh, and actual materials. Um, so essentially it's a looking at, there's a kind of a couple of points on the screen, but it's looking at a few different areas, um, essentially obviously from a safety side for the environment, um, eliminating the waste and actually making sure that the way it's manufactured um, is, you know, is obviously very green, but also how the potentially products can be reused um, and how they can be recycled. Um, so as I say, it's a really interesting accreditation that we're certainly seeing and a lot of furniture and different products that we that we use would have this accreditation and we're starting to actually see a bit of a trend with some of our clients um, maybe particularly clients moving down say out of London but starting to request that you know these elements and the, the materials that we use in man in um, actually on site you know what, what the accreditation is what the environmental credit credentials are so that's that's certainly interesting there's obviously yeah, a huge amount more from an accreditation, um, but those were just two I thought were interesting. So our next point here is just to try and do a bit of a product focus on a few, um, I'd say slightly more innovative um, other materials or products. So this one I, yeah, I love, I think it's a great idea. Um, so this is actually looking at taking waste material 
um, normally that's on its way to landfill and then actually kind of crushing it down and making um, essentially panels or, or materials. So we started looking at a really interesting desking range um, that's coming out, which is using these as desktops. Um, you've got storage, there's, there's different elements that the panels can be used. Um, and as I say, it's a you know, great product, 100% recycled material, you know, different elements are very hard to recycle normally, actually crushed down and kind of brought back into use, um, which is great to see. Um, again, love this company. Um, very interesting, looking at uh, reusing waste material. Um, so in particular, I, I wasn't aware, but waste clothing is, is a big problem. Um, and this is looking at actually taking different elements, as obviously an example on the screen around um, jeans. And you know, I know they've worked with quite a few different um, materials, but it's looking at essentially shredding that down, creating a, a material that can then be brought back into furniture and that kind of recycling um, that circular economy of, of clothing so that it doesn't you know, go to waste, keeps that level of efficiency. Um, this one's really interesting. So it's a, a relatively new company. Uh, and I'm not aware of, of really anyone else that's doing anything quite like this. So a company called Organoid, um, they're actually looking at bringing in um, aromas uh, and smells from essentially from nature, different scents. Um, one of the things obviously, you know, the why it's touched on is a big element is looking at scents. And this is really interesting, actually bringing that, um, that nature in, you know, kind of another of the five senses being engaged. And obviously just the way it's manufactured is, you know, is, is, is amazing. You know, looking at proper biodegradable products, um, carbon neutral kind of manufacturing. It's just to say the way it's made as well as what the product itself does um, is excellent. Just feeds in very well to the sustainability side. Um, another product that's quite interesting, um, huge amount of options, you know, carpet, I think by and large, pretty much every major manufacturer has got some great options. Um, some are focused on different elements. So some are more focused on um, kind of carbon neutral or even carbon negative, um, some of the products are looking at now. This particular product from Desso uh, is actually looking at improving the air quality. Um, so it's kind of trying to capture the, the fine dust particles uh, which are in the air, which can affect uh, your lungs. And essentially, you know, kind of a big part of air quality is, is getting that um, kind of purifying them out of the air. So as I say, this option, four times more effective um, than a standard carpet tile. And as I said, the, you know, the recycled element is, is great. And fire, I love what they're doing in terms of a take back scheme. So um, where carpets at its end of its life, you know, actually kind of taking that back in, recycling it. And um, I think in particular where from maybe a sort of more of a landlord side and building um, often at like a cat A level. So at an initial refurbishment when you know, waiting for a client to come in often a very cheap um, carpet gets put down just to kind of keep you know, obviously the space looking good, keep the dust down. Um, so I think that's particularly would play in well, you know, if we've got a take back scheme that those floors not often, they're not often down for very long, often get kind of taken back up, depending on obviously the, um, you know, the, I guess how the building's managed. But you know, where carpets pull back up quickly, actually better take it back. I think it's a great idea. Um, and then the final sort of product, I guess, to say something really interesting. Uh, plasterboard obviously gets used a huge amount in um, refurbishments and, and new builds. So this is actually looking at an alternative to that. And um, yeah, not quite sure how they've managed to kind of put it together, but I say a very sustainable product. So yeah, 100% biodegradable, um, non-toxic. Yeah, there's even some great um, kind of elements where it's anti-mold. Um, so it's actually better than standard plasterboard at controlling uh, the mold. It's um, in terms of having slightly breathable element to it, regulating the moisture. Um, and actually it's got slightly better acoustic properties as well than standard plasterboard. So there's some good you know, kind of points um, that, as I say, are advantages over what's, what's currently been brought through. Um, and really, so I think I was just going to try and sort of finish or summarize the points around sustainability is, I think just trying to encourage, um, particularly obviously landlords and you know, business um, owners is just to try and make a bit of a start. Um, you know, a lot of elements that are more sustainable, 
Um, not all of them, but quite a few, there is a bit of an upcharge on costs. So, you know, we may not be able to look at everything throughout a space, but it's looking at, you know, whether there's a couple of more sustainable elements that potentially could be brought in. Um, some of the things like the, the carpet, for example, is, you know, is a very small upcharge. Um, I think it's around about something like a pound per square foot sort of upcharge. It's, you know, it's not, we're not talking a big increase. Um, so it's looking at, as I say, what little elements potentially we can do. Obviously, the overall building, which um, you know, Nella and White have touched on, there's a lot from uh, ensuring that that's up to up speed, but also, I guess, investing in the property, um, particularly along the south coast, you know, making it a real destination um, and, and I, guess, I guess bringing it up to standard uh, that maybe companies from London or you know, potentially outside of uh, the UK, you know, to attract them in and and uh, encourage them. So hopefully that's been uh, interesting and a couple of useful points around sustainability. Um, so we will move on into okay, a bit of a attempt to do a question and answer session. I appreciate we're in quite a deep topic. So um, hopefully it's things that we can try and help out on. Um, so I know there's a few questions come in. I had someone had submitted a question um, I guess we could start with just before, you know, if anyone wants to throw questions into the chat, please feel free. Um, the question around building support systems that can be retrofitted to a building uh, for better well-being. Um, so there's definitely a lot of that. We're seeing um, quite a few different options, obviously, depending on how much investment and how much uh, you'd actually like to engage the physical building. Um, but there's definitely a lot of systems that can be retrofitted, you know, kind of around managing um, air quality or actual sort of occupancy levels, um, you know, kind of efficiencies. There's, you know, there's a big, um, it's a big part. There's a lot of technological uh, advance from that side. So it's a quick look at the um, chat. So, um, so yeah, thank you, John, again for your questions. Um, space so touch could be a hard one. Think about the cleaning aspects, how are you finding the use of tactile materials are changing? So I think there's probably maybe two sides to this point, I would suggest. There's obviously right currently, um, there's a much bigger awareness and kind of, I guess, um, concern around cleaning, um, which I don't think will go away. But yeah, there is an increased level of cleaning regimes typically. At the moment so i think people are more aware of what materials are being used and making sure they can be cleaned properly um i think we i don't know, it'd be interesting to hear what wyatt says but i think we are definitely seeing more um materials you know kind of coming back to the biophilic side i guess and the sustainability but um we're definitely seeing a, a much bigger trend around awareness of what materials are made of um possibly more than the actual material but I don't know if Nella or Wyatt's got anything to add on that question. Yeah, just to, to um, just to touch on the extended cleaning. Um, obviously, because of the whole COVID um, aspect, there are different antibacterial, antiviral um, like fogging systems. Um, certainly, at the Headspace uh, facilities where I'm based, uh, they basically do um, every thirty days. They do a deep um, disinfectant and spray this fogging over all of the furniture, the surfaces, and it basically leaves a film across the, um, the desking for 30 days, um, just to help prevent the spread of the virus. And again, they've enhanced the, um, the cleaning regime. Um, and, the, and I think also what was mentioned earlier about like putting monitoring of um, sensors, um, so where companies are looking at the capacities of areas that are being heavily utilized, um, they've got the data behind it to see actually, okay, so the co-working breakout facilities are being used more than the kind of um, the smaller pod areas and actually we've got to um, enhance the cleaning um, around those facilities. So I think like the monitoring sensors is going to become a very big part to a lot of businesses um, to kind of moving forward. Nella, can I interrupt a second? I'm, I'm yes. Mike, uh, we're finding that, uh, I mean, we're fitting out two buildings at the moment, as you know, just on two major lettings in the last three months. 
uh, and they're all going for uh, not fabrics because you can't clean fabric. So they're all going for plastics or leathers because they can wipe them 97 times a day. So I don't think going forward, you're going to see soft fabrics for a while because we both buildings we've got, I've got cleaners in now all day and half times at night as well. And they're just going round and round and round and round and round, wiping the surfaces, cleaning the surfaces, cleaning every door handle, every kick plate, every toilet. And that's just going on 24 hours a day. So I, I think there'd be, I mean, if you, our more Blatch building looks exactly what this picture is. I mean, we've done all the booths, we've done all the fabric, we've done all the, the, the colored walls. I mean, you've seen all of our buildings. I mean, they're exactly what you're demonstrating today. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't see the soft furnishings. I think it's going to go back to, 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 to solid plastics and solid leathers. It yeah. just doesn't work. You can't be sure that's clean and it, it's not good enough. So if you have a, a high density building and we have buildings with thousand people in a call center, we just can't have these soft fabrics. And also they're not durable enough. They get wrecked very fast. Yeah. So I, I, I think the look of it's fine, but I, I don't agree with you at all on the fabrics. It'll, it'll, it just won't happen at the current time. Yeah, no, good comments, Nigel, and I agree with you. Like, I think um, people will, I think the nervousness about people coming back into an office um, is going to play a major part because people... Well, the cleaning, the clean, I mean, that's exactly what's happening. I mean, with they're coming back in again, and they're just employing more and more and more cleaners. So the, the whole COVID regime that we're finding in the buildings is focused around increasing the air handling mm -hmm. systems, agree with you. Um, the breakout areas, yes, we're doing a lot more of them, but I, I go back again, all on hard surfaces. You mm -hmm. can't be sure this is clean. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a great point. As I say, thank you, Nigel, for um, yeah, for, for support there. I think we've, what we tend to, in our kind of conversations, I guess, with clients, is you've got potentially two elements. You've got looking at the, um, I could be the short term, say six months to a year, where, you know, we're hoping things that COVID is something that we can eradicate over that that time um so i think we we tend to talk to clients about a, a short-term response and obviously looking ahead um we have seen we have seen quite a mix i think we've had some of our um projects we have been introducing fabrics but i guess it tends to come down to the client or the landlord's views um on what sort of level you know what the cleaning regime is within the space i know some people have been using the um the sort of the sprays on a lot of the fabric, so the um, you know, they say I appreciate it's not quite as, as good as wiping it down, but kind of the antimicrobial sprays. But no, it's a very interesting point. I would be and, we, and we have, I mean, no, 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 we have a lot of office buildings, and I don't think we've got one building that is yet back 100% occupied. Mm. And so we, you know, we've got them from a thousand people in the building right down to to to, to financial services, to, to to banks, to wealth managers, um, and uh, the cleaning, the cleaning and the air handling are the two issues. Yeah. Um, the, your, your suggestion about the carpets was interesting because we don't. We put in absolutely gorgeous carpets to start with, and we never take them up and take them away again. And they're very. We, we like that. I think trying to let a building with a tin floor where you choose the carpet later just doesn't present well. Mm -hmm. So we tend to put the blinds and the carpets in, and we put the reception furniture in, and we offer a service of of interior design and, and as I say your, the, the pictures you've shown are, are, are fantastic um, and I think Nelly you would say we, we you know we're doing 99% of what you suggested already S surprisingly enough we've never had a comment that there's anything wrong with it so I you know I think what you're suggesting going forward is was interesting you know we've as I said we've done what three major lettings since September big ones including to the government um, and They've all still been the, worried about the old-fashioned things, asbestos, air handling, air hand, you know, the, the speed of the air handling and the cleanliness of the air handling, um, mm. uh, and being able to clean. And you know, whether we go from paper to air hand, to hand dryers, paper dryers, yeah. and the amount of cleaning, and we're not getting any kickback at all. And again, Nella will tell you, we have the best rents on the south coast by miles. Yeah. by producing the best buildings in the best possible in the best possible state when people view it both from car parking landscaping bicycles showers uh, sitting out areas in the gardens we spend hundreds of thousands if not millions on the landscaping which other landlords don't and they're cleaned and and you know they're they're, they're, they're pruned and cut every single week so the whole package is as as, as, as good as it possibly can be yeah 
But I think I don't think anybody perceives that. I, mean, I don't think anybody knows where offices are going to be in six months' time or a year's time. I think we're all we're all crystal ball gazing. Yeah. Um, and uh, all we can actually do is make the present what we've got in the best possible light, so we're streets ahead of everybody else. So I think there'll be a flight to quality. Uh, I think you know tatty old 60, 60s buildings with. You know, rubbishy furniture and rubbishy everything in, which is impossible to clean, is is long gone. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah. we are finding—I mean, to be fair, we are finding that the, the, the companies who want to uh, care about their employee involvement, some don't. I mean, the, the building we've let to the government, the government don't give up monkeys about what the staff think or what the public think. This is what you're going to get if you don't like it. Bugger off. Um, but that's the government. But the sort of law firms and financial services companies, people are, you know, are liking sort of pods. I've not yet seen what I call afternoon sleep pods. There was a there was a big article in the South in the in the Echo the other night that, that the hospitals are introducing sleep pods, so you can go in a corner and the sort of pod comes down over the top of you. You can have a snore for half an hour and go back to your desk. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how many employers would accept that, but they're doing them in the hospitals because the staff are on such long working hours. Yeah. But but being able to go off into a pod and work or do a Zoom call or like your yellow booths here, have little internal meetings with people is is uh, is, is very attractive. Mm-hmm. But we're also finding that people are missing terribly the ability to meet clients. And so if you go back to the more Blatch building, which you were involved in, mm-hmm. um, they're keeping the, the visitors away from the staff. So they're, they're doing... 10, 15, 20 meeting rooms. Again, very smart, nice fabrics, you know, colours and all the rest of it. But and they and they can be cleaned every day. Every every visitor can have a the building can be cleaned between visits. But they want to face people again. I mean, everybody's forgotten what it looks like to meet a client and have a cup of coffee and a chew. And you know, legal meetings and accounting meetings are, are all going to come back with a bang. Absolutely. Um, and, how, and in what that environment is, is going to be important. And I, go back to square one, and cleaning is going to be vital. And it may still be vital in one, two, three, four, five years time. So I do think the fabric thing you need to think about. Mm. I think you're definitely an exception to the norm, Nigel. Um, your buildings have always been those kind of set above um, other buildings on the South Coast. And um, it's just trying to highlight to people that actually you've got to do a little bit more to kind of um, meet those corporate agendas. Yeah. Interestingly, interestingly enough, and, and, and you guys won't necessarily know this, but when we, we did, when we did the fit out for Law Black, so we've got 30,000 feet of office with 200 lawyers plus support staff, they did the fit out like this, and it was very, very, very inexpensive. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to say we spent, I don't know, a million pounds on the fit out for 250 people, all that's including desk chairs, computers and everything. And then KPMG had 12,000 feet and spent 4 million for, for 80 people. You know, absolutely ridiculous amount. I mean, it was what I would call HSBC, you know, banking space. Um, and in fact, this sort of space is much more attractive and the staff mm-hmm. like it and it's got a real feel about it and the, and the staff like it and like coming to work and as you say, they have cops and have the sandwiches in the booths and all sorts of things. So, but there is a there is a, a still a big issue with with landlords so with tenants the cost of their fit out frightens them mm-hmm. I mean, it really does frighten them and so if one can offer an attractive design at a price and this isn't expensive what you're showing here at all yeah. it's actually very inexpensive I think also the other comment is that the tax savings for sustainable products um, with the super 130 percent deduction I think Jim had mentioned about um uh, i think when people think think about the fit out they think oh actually it's going to cost an arm and a leg actually if you're using sustainable products there is definitely tax savings that can be had um which people need to factor in to the actual uh, the bottom line essentially as you're assuming people are making money never <laughs> Yes, but, we, but there are different ways of financing a fit out, like similar to you, where we're, whether we can spread it over uh, the term of the lease and amortise it that way, um, or you could do a higher lease um, purchase agreement, for example. So we're, um, finding, we're finding, as you know, that if we do it, in a lot of cases, we'll pay for the fit out for the, for the tenant, because it just doesn't, it takes the hassle away from them, they can't afford to pay for it in the first place, so 
particularly the professional companies, they don't like spending money. Yeah. That's, That's very good. Yeah, thank you, Nigel. Uh, sorry, I'm not in, so, so I'll shut up. No, no, no. Thank you. Sorry, just to go back to the point on fabrics there, Josh. Yeah. Um, not to dig up an old stone or anything, but um, I know I've been working with a couple of clients recently who have been very concerned about infection control, like Nigel says. Um, however, they really, really want to get some fabrics in there. Um, so what we've been doing with them is working with um, Chimera. I know we've been working with a lot. They do a, a quite a good range of antimicrobial um, fabrics. So whilst they're not wipe clean or leather, they do have those qualities to control the virus as well. So it does protect in, in some sense as well. Um, but that's in the sort of not such high use areas. It was more of a kind of within the individual office spaces themselves. There is a, there is a durability, uh, there's a durability element as well. I mean, one of the best examples, of which I would think none of you have been around, but if you ever go to the McLaren Centre up in, in Woking, it's in the lakes um they have no uh, uh ron dennis was completely um excuse my french anal so nobody was allowed a drink or food in the office environment at all it's not allowed you had to go to, if you wanted to eat to drink you had to go to the cat canteen and what that did is it made the office space and the furniture last 10 times longer because you didn't have coffee and dirty hands and chocolate cake and all the other things which just get spilt in in office environment space and and there's, i think there's an awful lot of benefit to that so if you have the breakout areas uh, without food and drink with fabrics fine but and you can also put fabrics on the walls i mean again if you go to the royal blacks building then you remember there's there's, there's wallpapers and materials which make the space very attractive and colorful without having to have fabric and yeah. fabric, not, fabric is not durable you spill a cup of coffee on those yellow cushions they're buggered they're finished and that happens every day i mean you know you, you you guys probably don't see that but it does they just they just don't last so in four or five years time that lot's going to go to the tip and you're going to start all over again hmm. which isn't going to be the case if you have plastics or leathers or whatever harder materials yeah no i agree as I, say, I think it's interesting. It also comes back again, like you say, the quality. Yeah, and it sounds obviously there's a lot of investment that you put into your buildings and materials and furniture up front, which I think ultimately is one of the most sustainable ways of doing it because you're not, as you say, you're not replacing furniture on a regular basis. So, but we have to, I mean, in some of the harder use buildings, particularly the call centers, they are absolutely trashed. Yeah. The yeah. kids don't give a shit. I mean, they'll just trash a building, they'll spill the coffee and just leave it on the floor and walk off and sit in another desk. I mean, it's, you know, so we have, you have to have durable materials and you have to have cleanable materials. Yeah. No, I agree. No, I think it's very good. I say I appreciate all the insights that you would have that we don't see kind of further on. So um, that's great to... I mean, I'm hoping what you're what you're what you're saying today is is the is the way forward. But I mean, certainly Nella Nella and I will will see in the first instance when people come around how much they actually care. Mm. And at the moment, because of COVID, because of people saying, "Should I go back to work? Is it safe?" I and mean, if you take a train carriage, I don't think anybody willingly today would go in a crowded train up into London or no. an underground because your perception will be the air, the fabric, the materials is going to have some contamination in it. So I think going back to where we, you know, where you start these things is there'll be a lot of decentralization and people will want to work near where they live. Yeah, no, uh, yeah. Be able to get there without going in a dirty train carriage or a bus or whatever it's going to be and go to a safe environment. And that safe environment may well last for many, 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 many years because, you know, COVID is not going to disappear completely. And there's likely there'll be another one in a year or two's time or some other on some other basis. Yeah. Yeah, I think we um, we captured on a lot of that in our first webinar on the future of offices in terms of... You didn't invite me to that, Nella, so I wasn't able to come on. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I'll send you the recording, Nigel. Um, so we have a question from Abby, um, and she is curious about whether we've seen an increase of interest on sustainability of fit-out items, for example, computers having a recognised energy rating standard. So I'm going to pass that to Wyatt, because you're obviously handling on the design aspect, and if you have any comments on that. Yes, I mean, sustainability is definitely on the rise. Um, the few projects I've been working on recently um, I've been asked to double check on a, a number of items, carpets, fabrics, etc. 
um, in just making sure that they are sustainable. So we use a lot of products that have been made from recycled products and also can be recycled at the end of their life as well. So that's really important. Um, in terms of the computers sort of side of things, I don't get heavily involved in that. Um, but I'm sure that is another area that we could certainly get some help on in terms of sustainability. I think when we're looking at the FitWell rating um, and the certifications with the low impact, um, the equipment, some of the equipment that is used, like um, just in terms of like the co-worker, the canteen facilities that comes under that area as well. So just the m and &E equipment. Um, so yes, I think more and more so when it's kind of a generic use, um, I think that will be looked at quite, um, quite closely now. Yeah. No, as I say, I guess just to back up what Wyatt was saying, it's definitely a lot of people are requesting and wanting to see the certification. Um, and that was sort of tried to mention a couple, but there is, I think, one of the things we're finding in terms of so many different standards uh, and accreditations. So we're just trying to create some kind of framework of being able to look at which ones, obviously, we're recognising, you know, which ones we may promote um, or better than, a, than another. But yeah, certainly, certainly a growing trend. And I think certainly. I guess just a start, but good. I don't know. Is there, has anyone else got any other questions or any other points they want to I sort of throw out there or, or pop in the chat? Good. Okay. Thank you. Well, I say really appreciate everyone's time. Um, we'll get a recording pulled together as well. Get that sent round. But um, yeah, and always obviously happy to help out. Feel free to reach out to yeah, Nella and myself. And uh, do what we can to help. Yep. Thank you, guys. Very useful. And thanks for your time, Nigel. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank right. you, guys. Right. Thank, Thank you all. Have a good day. Bye bye.